I also wanted to thank Dan uh, for agreeing to do this. Uh, this is actually our first AMA. Um, ask me anything, for those of you that don't, haven't heard of the term. Uh, so we'll, we'll see sort of how this is going to work. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of excited and, and, and I'm you know, trusting you guys are going to come up with all sorts of crazy questions for Dan, uh, starting from why 16-bit method count? Um, interestingly enough, I've actually uh, known Dan for some time now. Uh, so it's sort of through my brother who's over there who actually, actually happens to be his neighbor. Uh, one day he found out it, you know, he was living next to someone famous, so that was sort of awesome. Um, and what's also interesting for me to be here is that, or just, just Dalvik in general, is that I also happen to co-run the uh, Java user group. And so when Android came out, there was this whole question of like, is this really Java, is it not? What is Dalvik doing? Um, I've actually then went on my sort of my own research of, of Dalvik and sort of dug a little bit. And actually, I've been pretty impressed. I mean, sure enough, we now have art, but nevertheless, um, it's really an awesome piece of technology. Uh, so much so, actually, I wanted to show you guys this, that uh, my brother decided to get this. <laughs> which I had on my car actually for a very long time. Uh, but um, I'm actually gonna keep it now as a souvenir, at least one of them, and then give the other one uh, to Dan. <laughs> Maybe I'll just start the, the first question. If you can sort of tell us a little bit about how do you end up with a title Virtual Machinist? Hello, hello, okay. How did I end up with the name Virtual? I, I made it up. Um, uh, so that was, I had that on my business card um, since 2002, I think, which was when I was at Danger. Um, as with many companies, actually, I don't know if, if, uh, if Yelp is one of these, but uh, uh, you could basically get whatever you wanted on your business card as long as it wasn't something like vice president. Um, and uh, so, the, you know, there's always like kind of an informal competition of like who can have the coolest name. I, I picked virtual machinist because, of course, I work on virtual machines, and it seemed like a fun name. So that's, uh, I, they let it through, and I've been using it ever since. Awesome. So why don't we just have you guys raise your hands. I'll run around, give you the microphone, and, and we'll, we can go from there. Let's see who was, who was first. OK. So tell the story. So what happened? Where did, you know, from danger to Google? Mm. OK, um, sure. <laughs> So um, actually, I'm gonna, I'll start, I'll, I'll do you one better. I'll start from just before I was hired at Danger. Um, so do people here know what Danger was? No, okay, I'm, I'm seeing at least a, a, few, a few head shakes, no. Okay, so um, Danger produced uh, a phone called, uh, which was in the US mostly called the Sidekick. It was, brand, uh, it was sold by T-Mobile. Um, okay, so now you're getting a couple more nods. Um, so the T-Mobile the Sidekick was, uh, was a little smartphone. It had, uh, it had a web browser, it had an app store, and you could buy it in 2002. Um, and uh, I first saw a prototype of the Sidekick um, in, it was like 2001, and uh, it was a friend of a friend well, worked at Danger, um, you know, again, the, comp the company that made it, and I saw this thing and my jaw dropped. And I was like, this is the future. Uh, now keep in mind, at that point, the future was a, I think it was like, you know, 320 by 240, 16-bit grayscale display, um, you know, like the, that bad kind of like slow refresh LED, or I mean LCD that, you know, you don't really see that much of anymore. Uh, but still, it was the future, it was, you know, it was connected, uh, it was connected, it had a web browser, it had a camera, uh, took 160 by 120 pixel pictures. Um, but, you know, you could send an email from the thing, you could chat on, on AIM on it, right? Um, it was great. Um, and I wanted to be part of it, and I had no idea how. This was like, it was some guy, you know, like who I met at a party. I was like, how do I, how do I get a job at this place? Uh, it turned out I had another friend uh, I, who I didn't, even, I, I didn't even know at the time that he worked there, met him at a party, and he knew what I did. He's like, oh, you should come work for, for this company that I've been working for, Danger. I'm like, my jaw dropped again. <laughs> um, and um, so I, I interviewed there, and I, I got the job. And it turns out, so that guy, that, that guy who I met 
that first one, um, turned out to be, he wasn't really my, my boss, but I was, uh, uh, he was the other guy doing, or I, I guess I became the other guy doing the VM at Danger. So he was, this is a guy named Brian Swetland, who also went on to, to be on the kernel team on Android. Um, and so, um, so that's, that's how I landed at Danger. Um, I was at Danger for three years, almost to the day. Um, during the time I was there, so I joined uh, like the day, I think I signed my offer letter the day before the first sidekick shipped. Um, and then I was there for like four or five different hardware, you know, kind of hardware software revs. Um, during the last year that I was there, I was, uh, I got sort of, you know, kind of increasingly frustrated with uh, what I saw as management not really um, pushing the technology forward. It seemed like they were just sort of like, you know, like they weren't investing in the technology anymore. It seemed like they were just trying to kind of do kind of minimal revs. And that, as a software engineer, of course, is very frustrating. Um, and I had lots of ideas how I thought like this thing could be better. Um, meanwhile, you know, a year prior, um, a, a good handful of folks had left, had left Danger um, to form Android, which was then a separate company. Um, you know, and so at the point where I was like, okay, I was done with working on, you know, like kind of my deliverables for the whatever the current generation of the, you know, that next generation of, of the of the device was going to be. Um, I said, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start talking and see see if there's something I could figure out what to do next. And of course, I talked with my buddies who are now at Android, um, and that was I think I started that conversation more or less in like June of 2005. And during the time I was chatting with them, they got acquired by Google. And then I had, ended up having a round of interviews at Google, and then I was hired on to become, you know, you know uh, I, I don't know exactly what, but I was like eight, nine, tenth, something like that engineer uh, at Google on the Android team. So I wasn't part of that acquisition, but I was sort of like one of the early hires post-acquisition. Uh, and that's, yeah, I guess that's the story. That's how I, that's how I ended up on the, on the Android team. Hello. Um, what sort of changes did Delvic end up going through? Because I know in, um, especially in like later versions of Android, like around four, he started to get better concurrent uh, garbage collection and that kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so what kind of changes did it go through? Um, well, I think, you know, like, oh, so one thing to, to I, should, I should say, I left Google three years ago, so I am, in terms of um, sort of currency of what's been going on, I am, you know, three plus, three or so years out of date. Um, so I'll talk about what, what was happening while we were there, um, or sorry, while I was there. Um, the you know the thing to remember is that um, you know all you know all software is sort of um, uh, you know um, it's kind of influenced by the environment in which it finds itself. Um, so you know when when Dalvik was originally uh, designed, um, the constraints were different. You know so of course as time goes on. Um, so two things happen. One is you get experience with it, um, and the other is the constraints change. Um, you know, and so the thing I think you kind of called out particularly is garbage collection, um, which is I mean, it's fine. So you know that's that's one thing that did change over time, um, and one of the other thing you know one of the things that changed over time kind of in the underlying system is that multiple cores became something that were a thing on mobile, um, and that didn't used to be the case. Um, so the original, the, um, the original GC, um, whether or not, you know, however concurrent it would, would ha could or could have been designed to be, it could not have actually run literally concurrently with, um, with the application code because, of course, it was running on a single core underneath. Um, one of the things that did happen, though, um, you, know, at, at, you know, at the time that we finally had multiple cores to contend that <laughs> either at our disposal or to contend with, depending on how you think about it, um, uh, is that you know that became uh, that became a tactic for uh, reducing GC pause times, and that's you know the, the real thing that you care you know the real thing that you care about is having a good user experience. So you know like fixing GC isn't something that that say like 
you know, sort of came in kind of from the top as like a, this must happen because, you know, because, you know, from the top it's sort of like, we want smooth graphics, you know, we don't want, you know, we don't want, we don't want glitches, right? That's the sort of thing that, that, uh, that comes in. And then by the time it filters down to, to my level, it's like, okay, so what, what can we do? You know, um, and, um, you know, reducing GC pause times, you know, was one of those things. And one of the things that we could, could do because we were on a, multi-core pro, you know, processor, or could, could start to assume that, is do stuff where GC was happening in, a, in more explicitly, you know, uh, more explicitly concurrently with the mutator threads. I hope that was a good answer for you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. So I heard I th Danger didn't directly begat Android. Or the, what happened to the people at Danger? They just kind of fell on the vine because they oh. weren't doing the right thing. Oh no! Okay, so um, what happened at Danger? Um, so, uh, um, well, there. So over, over, like you know, when I when I left Danger, I wasn't I wasn't the first person to leave. I was, and I certainly wasn't the last. Um, so if you follow the people who stayed at Danger, eventually Danger got acquired by Microsoft, um, and they. Uh, I think this is. Pretty widely regarded uh, as a pretty bad debacle, kind of for all involved. Um, they, their, um, the Danger team ended up. Um, I think, you know, to the, to the extent they were, they still ended up working on kind of mobile stuff. A lot of them uh, ended up getting uh, put on a team that was working on this thing that Microsoft came out with, that eventually came out with called the Kin, which was a prog project which was already in progress at Microsoft at the time of the acquisition um, and probably already doomed. Um, I think in the end, the reports were that it sold like a couple thousand units total. It was, it, it was, um, yeah. Anyway, um, so not a, not a, not a, not a successful product, unfortunately. Um, uh, so that was that was kind of what happened to Danger directly. Um, but in the meantime, there, uh, like I said, I wasn't the first person to leave. I wasn't the last. Um, there was, um, you know, a, in addition to people going from Danger to um, to Google, or you know, v either via Android or or more directly, um, there was also a good handful of folks who ended up going to Apple. In the, you know, 2004, 2005 time, time range, to work on, at the time, some secret project, um, and uh, I, at, during those couple of years, um, you know, I had friends who made that jump, and we would meet at parties, and we, you know, on both sides, it's like, oh, what are you working on? Yeah, I can't really tell you. What are you working on? Uh, I can't really. We we knew what we were working on. There was no there was no doubt in on either side. Um, but you know, we towed the company line, um, so you know it came as no surprise uh, to a bunch of us when when the iPhone was announced, and it came as no surprise when Android was announced on the other side. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times sort of the environment that Dalvik was created and uh, shaping its mm -hmm. form. What sort? What were you anticipating the mobile phone space? How were you anticipating it changing? Uh, at the point where it was created, or when you initially yeah. created Delvic? Um, you know, I think the, the I, don't, I don't think that I have, we had any super major insight into it, other than, into, you know, Moore's Law is, you know, seems to hold um, with the, um, so, you know, it's like you look at what you had in 2005 and kind of extrapolate out. You know, so you knew the CPUs were going to get uh, more numerous and, and generally faster and there would be more RAM and there would be more, you know, more flash or flash equivalent storage. Um, you know, the thing that, um, you know, the, the one wild card is still battery capacity, which is, has not really been exactly following um, kind of the, the same, same kind of pace um, although maybe we'll get a get something else. anyway, but yeah, but the, that was that was sort of the anticipation, right? So at the time that I was designing Dalvik, um, I knew that in the short term, you know, it was going to be an interpreter. It was going to be, you know, and it was going to be running on, you know, on, you know, you know, a couple hundred megahertz kind of processor. Um, 
it wasn't going to have a ton of RAM, you know, so I think, you know, we were talking about like 64 megs of RAM as maybe being the kind of the minimal that, that, that we are, or the, you know, kind of typical sort of thing that we would be running in. So, you know, that became very important to, to sort of uh, kind of use well. But of course, over time, we expected, you know, more RAM, fast, faster CPU, more cores, that kind of thing. Um, did you have a, does that, yeah, yeah okay. Um, I saw there was a question over there, so maybe. Thank you. Well, he, the other guy kind of asked part of my question, which is like, did you ever imagine that Dalvik would get this big? And, uh, but since he kind of answered it, it's like, I know you named it after the, the hometown of your ancestors in, in Iceland. <laughs> Have you ever been back there? <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll try to answer both. Um, so. I certainly, I, I hoped it would be big. I mean, you know, I think that's kind of like the, maybe it's the, the dream of every software engineer to have a piece of software that you use being used by literally billions of people. I mean, like, you know, it's like, I don't, you know, I didn't wake up every day thinking, okay, yeah, it's, it's definitely gonna do it, or whatever. It's like, you know, you hope for it to be successful. Um, and that, that was my hope, and I, of course, um, I was, uh, you know, I've been, Overwhelmed by uh, you know by how uh, kind of how widely it's ended up being deployed. Um, so I, I should correct the record on uh, on uh, on the name. It's, yes, it's named after uh, after a town in, in Iceland. Which by by the way, this shirt I'm wearing is um, has the sign. It's actually based on a photo that I took at the entrance to the town. So yes, I've, yes, I've been there. Um, no, um, I've never, to my knowledge, I don't have any Icelandic ancestors. Um, that was it was a it was a prank it was a Wikipedia prank, I did not do it, <laughs> but I know who did. <laughs> um, so some somebody put that in Wikipedia and it kind of became gospel for a while. So it's it's been kind of fun, um, but no, uh, 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 no. As far as I know, uh, there's no there's no Icelandic blood, literally running in my veins, um, but I have been to Iceland. Um, let's talk about let's talk about uh, the language uh, you know of choice Java, and uh, since you don't work at Google, can you describe the controversy like that that you know happened between Oracle and Google, uh, or uh, when they first picked Java? Was there any plan on using any other language? Um, and uh, if if uh, in the future, do you know? How would Google support Java 8 or any of the um, new versions of Java? And what the difference between, you know, just can you get into the that topic? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So there's a, there's a lot there. Um, I'll I'll see if I will see if I can't talk about uh, some of it. Yeah. Great great question. I'm probably not going to be uh, be able to give you a full answer. Um, so for one thing, I don't work for Google anymore. Um, I can't tell you any sort of official Google position on, you know, on Java 8 or, or, or anything like that. Um, uh, what I can tell you is that when we were um, first starting out, uh, we had thought that we would do three different languages that we were going to support um, all as first class. Uh, we were going to do JavaScript, Java, and C++. And we were going to do um, kind of full-fledged application toolkits that were exposed in all of them. And our hope was that we would be able to have, you know, like one code base for that and sort of like have multiple language bindings. Um, and the, the thought at the time was that JavaScript was gonna be good for like little apps, like things, um, again, you have to think back to like 2005 when this was happening. So like widgets on the desktop were kind of like a thing. And um, those, you know, like there were a couple of sort of competing uh, kind of widget toolkits, they were all, all at least mostly based on JavaScript. It seemed like you know with like CSS, the it was starting to get to the point where you could actually do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, it, you know um, the idea was like okay, that would be a pretty low bar to entry. Like be able to have like a, you know a lot of interesting little apps in that. And then um, you know then on the kind of other end of the spectrum, uh, people you know it's like we were thinking like oh you know it's like there's going to people who are going to really want to be like close to the metal. They're going to be doing like crazy you know, heavy duty stuff. Um, we want to give them, you know, some, you know, a nice, uh, kind of a nice to the metal kind of API. 
C++ was, it was sort of like the natural choice for that. And then the, the idea was like, okay, so then there was this sort of like vast middle. Like, for the, it's like it was bigger than a JavaScript app, but like, you know, you didn't want to like uh, have to, you know, uh, go all the way to, to C++. Java seemed to, to fit the bill for that. And in practice, what happened over time, it seemed like, well, um, on the, the sort of like that widgety side, it was like the, the stuff that we had built in Java seemed like, oh, it wasn't so bad to build the little apps. Um, so that kind of got de-emphasized. And then on the, the other end, um, it seemed like, you know, the people who were building apps internally, like they were building perfectly good big you know, for, for, for the time, you know, big apps in, in Java, and they were working well enough, and so the C++ kind of fell by the wayside. Um, we did know that ultimately, you know, we were gonna have what, what ended up being called the NDK, you know, for, for doing native bindings, right? Um, it, although, you know, in a, a kind of Android 1.0, we didn't really, we didn't expose that, but there were native bindings, bindings all along, and the assumption, at least my assumption was, was certainly that um, at some point that would be sort of like we would batten down the hatches and, and uh, expose that as something that was a well-supported API going forward, and we did. Um, let's see, and there might have been some other question in there, and um, it, oh yeah. Dalvik was designed for Java in mind, right? Because you guys, it's not Java, uh, you know, it's, it's Android, Dalvik's version of oh, Java. Yeah, well, so, uh, yes, so Dalvik was, um, Dalvik was designed to be a VM to run, you know, code that was originally written in the Java programming language. Um, and, and of course, um, you know, because we were taking the tactic of, at, at the time, of taking class files and translating them into the Dalvik, into Dalvik executables, then that may actually made us agnostic with respect to source code. So, you know, ul ultimately, um, you know, that, that decision meant that it was no big deal for like the people who like wanted to use Scala um, or, you know, any of those, the other languages that targeted, uh, that targeted uh, class files. Yeah. Actually, if I can add to that, were there any serious sort of thoughts about people actually using or enabling other languages or encouraging other languages for targeting Delvic? Well, I, I always liked the idea of people using other languages. And um, so, and, you know, I said it was no big deal for people to, to host other languages, but as it turns out, um, we did have bugs in our, um, in our translation tools. So like, uh, or actually, well, it, you can either call it Depending on what you want to call it, uh, uh, may or may not have been a bug. So, um, how about this? Let, let's just let's just say I was surprised by what it turned, what the uh, what the class file format ended up actually allowing as valid in certain cases. So, um, so, so in particular, the Scala compiler produced bytecode, which was kind of surprising at times. Um, so, I got a number of a number of really interesting bugs from from people who worked in Scala, um, where their perfectly rational Scala code turned into something that would not get successfully translated into a DEX file. Um, and it caused me, you know, a couple of days of head scratching here and there to, to get it all sorted out. Right, so um, I know this isn't exactly in your line, but um, when did Binder show up and how did that work? Uh, you're right, that's not my line. Um, so Binder, Binder was around fairly early on. Um, the, so, uh, do, actually, so uh, I'll ask another question. So do people know what Binder is in general? No, okay. Uh, so Binder is kind of like the underlying thing for doing IPC on Android. Um, and it's, uh, it kind of pokes, it's, uh, kind of straddles the border between kernel space and user space. Um, so originally, the, um, the binder was uh, a bunch of code that was written at Palm. Um, and um, among the people who ended up getting hired on, uh, on the Android team fairly early on were a few folks from Palm, uh, including um, some of the original binder authors at Palm. At Palm, they had ended up um, 
kind of saving that code by open sourcing it um, so that it wouldn't sort of kind of get sucked into wherever Palm got, Palm ended up. Uh, anyway, so, um, so Binder, Binder sort of had this kind of like, you know, saving throw um, and, uh, and landed um, both code and personnel on the Android team um, as the, you know, at, you know, early on it was the proposed solution for doing uh, for doing IPC and ended up being the actual solution, actual shipping solution for IPC on, on Android. Um, uh, I think that's about as high fidelity an answer I can, as I can give you. Thank you. Not to bring up any painful memories, but do you have any thoughts or anecdotes on the, on the 64K method limit? <laughs> ah. <laughs> um, no, it's not that painful. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll start with the most general. Hindsight is twenty twenty, <laughs> and no matter what you do, there's always going to be something that surprises you later, right? Um, so um, you know, so I didn't expect that that limit would ever turn out to be something that was as painful as it turned out to be. Um, at the same time, I'll, I'll say, um, before I left, um, before I left Google, I was actually in the process of revving the format to, uh, so that uh, you know a subsequent uh, you know version of, of Dex would be able to you know it would have been a 32-bit limit instead of a 16-bit limit. Um, that for whatever reason um, that work did not end up, or at least apparently did not end up continuing after I left. Um, but uh, that said, I think, you know, from the perspective of 2005, um, doing, this, doing this format, um, you know, from scratch, it, it, I think it was a reasonable decision. Um, I, don't think, uh, I don't think you could fault me for having made the decision. Um, <laughs> you can fault, you know, like, you know, you can, you can say it's like, yes, it's caused you pain <laughs> in the meantime. But, at, you know, um, you know the, the, again, going back to looking at like, what the constraints were like, you know, if you're if you're looking at a world where um, you know you're only going to have 64 megs for the entire system, fathoming that a single DEX file would be larger than you know large enough to, to blow that kind of that kind of limit, just didn't you know it just didn't seem that likely. And you know, for for its worth, it, it lasted for a while. Um, the the limit that did end up getting blown first was the, the number of strings. And we did, uh, and by we I mean I, uh, did address that in, in an update. So you know, there's, there's actually, if you, if you have more than 64,000 or you know, 64K worth of strings, um, then that's not, a, that's not a problem in DEX files today. And that's exactly because we did add some extra bits to the format. What sort of trade-offs would have happened if you had decided to make that, uh, whatever represents those methods, uh, 16 bits as opposed to 32 bits? Oh, fun question. Um, right, so, uh, so why do we end up there? Um, so uh, I encourage you to look at the DEX file format doc um, so you can, you can verify, verify this for yourself. Um, so, one of the, you know, so one of the things I, that I did while I, while I was designing um, the format was you know, I had the kind of the DX tool in its prototype form, right? It was generating DEX files, and you know, I had the opportunity to to tweak things and see how things how it altered, right? Um, so one of the things that I did a lot of was, oh, let's you know, let's see what happens, or let's take some statistics on you know how much space is taken up by you know X, Y, or Z, right? So one of the one of the X, Ys, or Zs was uh, was a method was a method reference, and um, the so and and one of the statistics I could get was like how many like how many method references were typical in the applications that we were seeing right. Um, so on the one hand, um, making so in certain places, uh, so not in, not in the bytecode itself, but in some some of the side structures, there's you know there's a uh, a fixed width field for 
uh, for method for like for a method reference. So that's something that, that there wasn't going to be an opportunity to have it be stretchy. So it's like if you if the limit were 32 bits, then it would be like a 16 bit compared to 16. It would be a 30. It would be a 16 bit hit on every single one of them, whether or not there were more in the in the, in the file or not. Right. So um, what I had to do to to pick that is like okay. So it's like if I if like I made that change, it's like so how much larger were the dex files going to be compared compared you know to not having it. Um, and you know the marching or kind of the general marching order from above was basically make these things as small as possible. Um, and of course, you know, it's like, well, if you make them zero size, they're not doing anything, right? So, so right, so, you know, so like, you know, so it's, it's really, um, you know, you have, to, you have to sort of like parse what's coming in from above, right? So um, the, the, the real, you know, the real thing is like, make it, make it small, but don't make it not useful, right? Um, so, um, you know, in this case, what, you know, the kinds of things that I observed were like, you know, typical applications didn't seem to be getting anywhere near the limit. Even our libraries, right, which were like the biggest things, you know, the biggest DEX files on the planet were things like, you know, the, the core, you know, the, the core uh, library. So, you know, like all well, the Java dot whatever's and the framework libraries, you know, Android dot whatever's, right? So those were the biggest DEX files on the planet. Um, and those weren't really even approaching the limit. So it seemed like, 16 bits, maybe not such a bad idea, right? Um, but, uh, um, and then I think there was one final thing, which was, uh, again, like look at, look, at the, look at the spec. You'll see in one of those fixed width fields, or, or you know, like for, um, like for method, method references, at, like coming off of like the class structure, or something like that. Um, you'll see that like the width of those things is a, it's like uh, it's like 32 bytes or something like that, which is a nice power of two. And so it's like, you know, if I if something were made wider than that, it would no longer be a power of two. It would have been a a, a uh, you know like a uh, more complicated a couple more cycles calculation uh, in the in the dispatch code for that particular thing. And so that you know that kind of decision or, or that kind of fact goes into play into sort of making that kind of decision. As you said, hindsight is twenty twenty. Can you talk about some of the things that later on you saw in the Dalvik development has as things that could have gone differently mm -hmm. or should have gone differently? Um, well, what what could have gone? I mean, yeah. So overall, I can't say I, I have too many com complaints with sort of like how how things have progressed. Um, really, th I think the the thing that I would say is that um, there were sort of developments that I would have wanted to to have happen um, on the kind of at the VM level sooner rather than later. So like you know after immediately after you know one O was out the door, the thing that I wanted to do like uh, like almost one of my my biggest ticket items was to was to um, do a major rev on the allocator in the GC, and that didn't actually get to happen for about a year. Um, you know, I knew that um, that having some kind of JIT would be a good thing. I would have loved to that to have happened. You know, you know, sooner rather than later. That's it's like really like my my complaints, if anything, are are sort of like more like sort of speed and speed and sequencing, and not like the actual sort of like A followed by B followed by C. Without getting yourself into legal trouble, can you tell us a little bit about the, maybe the, the thought process that went into even deciding to build Dalvik as opposed to go with Java, standard Java, or even Java ME for Android? So, um, yeah, and, and um, I don't think that there's, no, there's no legal problem with it. Um, you know, uh, I think you, you, can, you can tell from what, what I've been saying. It's like the, it, was all, it was all technically motivated. There's, like you see people in the press say like, oh, they only did it because you know, they were afraid of blah, 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 blah. But that's, 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 that's not true. It's like, you know, if what you want is to be able to memory map your executables across processes um, and not have it use a lot of memory, it's like you can't just use plain class files. It's like, 
it's the start and the end of it. Um, if you want to have an interpreter um, and you want to minimize the number of, you know, like you want to make it as efficient an interpreter as possible, well, you want to do something other than have um, you know, a stack-based machine that has instructions that are byte aligned. It's like, you know, and um, I think, you know, people's analysis of both of uh, Dalvik in specific and sort of like that general area, um, I think, bears that out. In fact, um, the the there was there was like a paper from I think it was like an academic paper from like 2004 or, or five or maybe even 2003, which was like it was called it was called something like the case for register machines, um, and it was like it was a, an academic group that, that had taken. Um, Java by code and had built a register machine translation of it and they had done kind of A-B comparisons and they were like, hey, look, this seems to work. It's like, that was, that was sort of like, prime, that, that was one of like the primary sources for, for my decision making process. Uh, just adding to that, because I used to write, I've, I've written Java ME code, because, mm -hmm. you know, Java used, Java runs on low memory devices, right? Like it, it runs on um, nowadays, it runs on Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. uh, Java 8, you know, um, but it, it, it has been running on low memory, memory devices for years and just fine. So was, was there a different reason or is it just uh, memory? So um, you have to take running just fine with a grain of salt. So Java ME was, uh, was very stripped down in many ways compared to a uh, kind of a full-fledged um, sort of, you know, the, the kind of full-fledged right. Java SE style um, deployment, right? So, uh, and I, just, just to, just so you know, like at Danger, um, so da the, the Danger application code was also based on Java, we, and we, we built, um, we, and again, where we is, Kind of mostly me, and I call it half me. Uh, built um, a, a Java ME compatibility as a thing on on top of Danger, um, and if you take a look at like the kinds of things that ME provided, it was actually fairly con fairly constrained. Um, so yes, you know you could see it running ju just fine, but just fine is not like being able to run kind of larger applications. Um, it was, uh, I don't know if you looked at like the, the kind of like allocation performance that you saw on those, like GC pauses were pretty awful. Um, there was actually a lot of inconsistency across ME implementations. I see it. Some, somebody has been in that trench. Um, okay, so for you, I'm gonna tell you a little story about, about danger, uh, or about, <laughs> about this, this particular aspect. So, um, one of the, so, you know, one of the things, that, again, that we're doing at Danger was building this ME compatibility. The idea was that, um, you know, we would be able to, to host ME-style apps on Danger. Not, not that there were that many of them, but um, we, run, we ran into, uh, in, the pro, in the process of, like, trying to, to get some of these onto, uh, onto our phone, we, we, we saw this, like, weird behavior. Um, so there's, in, in the Java APIs, there's a, uh, a static method system GC, and you call system .gc and it's supposed to perform garbage collection, right? And well, guess what? You perform garbage collection in a stop the world situation. It's going to stop the world, right? And it's going to take some time. Um, so we saw this uh, this application, which was like on every frame of animation, was calling system .gc. And I was like, why in the world would anyone do this? Because it's like it's like pausing like crazy, um, and you know, and it's not not getting good performance and um, so, you know, for, because we, act, and that was like the first of several cases that we saw of something like that. So, in the end, I ended up implementing this thing which was like, if you called system.gc more than, at like, more than a certain rate, we would ignore the other calls <laughs> because you weren't doing yourself any good. Um, and um, so, after, some time after like, uh, seeing this, I ran into a friend of mine who worked at a company where his job was porting games from one phone to another, and, and, and yes, they're both Java, but you still have to do porting. And I said, and I told him about this like crazy thing. It's like, we saw these things where they're doing system, I see all this stuff. He's like, oh yeah, we have to do that, because if, they, if we don't do that, the whole phone will crash. So, 
Um, anyway, so that was, that was Java ME. <laughs> Um, was there the decision not, not to build Dalek, uh, Davik, excuse me. <laughs> Exterminate. <laughs> to build, the decision to build Davik at all uh, ver versus use Java ME or Java SE, was that politically motivated or motivated by size of, of, of what you, what, the, the target runtime environment would need to be. This is uh, it's, this is all before Sun got acquired by by Oracle, right? That's right. So um, so what so one of the things that I was doing um, at Google uh, on the Android team very early on was evaluating other um, VMs. You know, for possible use in Android, and among the among the things, uh, you know, among the ones that we were talking about were some version, you know, like Sun. Sun at the time, did, there wasn't, yeah, there wasn't just one VM. You know, Sun had like several different products. Um, you know, both. Um, oh, did, did you have an answer? Yeah. Uh, if I can piggyback on this, so Savage A mm -hmm. had a phone at at one one year. At Java 1 one year, they passed out this lovely orange phone that didn't go anywhere. So you must have been aware of them. Oh, yeah. yeah. They were I, I, I was certainly aware of Savage. They were, they were, were, were they Java SE? Yeah. Okay. I got a nod of yes. Um, my, okay. So I was aware of them in general. I don't think I ever did kind of a, like a direct evaluation of their... VM per se, but you know. So anyway, but uh, but so, so let me go back to the answer to kind of the general question, which is, uh, uh, you know, what were you know like? So was that was it a political decision? Was it a business decision? What? So it was uh, fundamentally we knew that um, the the VM that we used had to have certain features, and um, whether those features came about by acquiring something and modifying it into shape or writing it ourselves, um, that was, um, you know, that was sort of like, um, that was sort of the secondary thing. So the, the primary thing was get a VM that had these features. So um, to my knowledge, Sun's VM offerings at the time didn't have good interpreter performance and did not have good memory performance in terms of running uh, multiple simultaneous applications in with using using real process protection, um, and those were pretty primary uh, pretty pretty primary things that we were we were aiming for. So, like, I don't I don't know this whether, whether the Savage Phone did this or not, but I I know there there was um, like Sun at the time there. The thing that they were talking about for doing the equivalent of app separation were these things called isolates. Um, isolates were a tactic for running multiple, a sort of kind of running multiple VMs, but in a single address space. And that would not have been acceptable for, for Android. You know, Android took the stance of, you know, we want, you know, like, you know, real kernel processes are kind of tried and true way of having good, kind of good intra device security. Um, and there's like that was sort of like and everything else kind of flowed from that. So that's why you know, for example, it was no big deal for us to have native code because you know in the it's kind of kind of in the old Java model, it's like oh well you can't have native code because well, then you can like break the security model. Look, we don't care about the Java security model because that's you know that's all sort of in the sing, you know within a single app. You know cross app is what mattered, and for us that became cross process. So the uh, Android SDK seems to have a lot of decisions made on it that are based on some of the uh, best practices for Dalvik applications. Was that a back and forth, or was it always just uh, the way Dalvik was designed, and then they just built the, uh, the, the support classes based on that? Well, um, I'm not sure I can give you a, a 
great high fidelity answer. Um, I mean, a lot of a lot of the development of the um, of, of, well, I guess the, the early development of the SDK was, you know, I think there, there was a lot of sort of early discussion. So, I mean, one, one thing that comes, in, comes to mind is like, oh, do you use enums or not? Like, that's sort of like a thing that people like to bicker about one way or the other. Um, and um, I, I think it, it was kind of, I would call it a fairly organic process. Um, you know, certainly before all the hatches had been battened down before Android 1.0, like, you know, it's like, you know, we had an opportunity to change things. So if people, uh, you know, if people happened to be doing one kind of idiom or, or another, it was like there, there, we did have an opportunity to kind of like adjust for that. But at the same time, you know, we certainly had, um, from the VM team perspective, we had recommendations about, about things. Um, but I don't, th I don't think there wasn't, it wasn't like a one-way information flow. I think it's fairly organic. Uh, the thing that I don't know is, again, I'm a few years out of date. I'm not sure if there's something that's sort of happened in more recently that you're thinking about. But if there is, then I couldn't really tell you. Can you actually just elaborate on the whole enum thing? Not enums themselves, but there's a lot of sort of performance versus good design. Right? In, in the early days, a lot of things were done in the, in, in the name of performance. Mm -hmm. Was there any effort sort of to, to speed things up beyond just the, uh, the JIT to make it easier to sort of adopt standard Java best practices and apply them on Android? Like to speed up basically that transition? Uh, to speed up? Basically be able to use standard Java best practices, uh, right? Proper, you mean like, like proper, to be able to use enums? <laughs> well, whether it's enums or proper encapsulation, yeah. things of that nature, right? Like not to use publics everywhere, you know, mm -hmm. things that sort of developers are used to from outside yeah. of the Android world. Um, I mean, I, so the way, the way I would think about it um, is more like um, over time, the, you know, again, Moore's law takes effect, right? You can start to do, um, in the, so, there, I mean, two things happen. One is just sort of without doing anything that, you know, your code, um, you know, it's like your code has more memory to, to, to use, uh, to play with, and, um, you know, runs on a faster CPU and stuff like that. Um, so um, that alone means that there's, there are things that you can do without worrying about how long they'll take that you didn't used to be able to do before. But then at the same time, you know, um, eventually the, um, you know, like when we, Finally, got to to have a JIT out there. Well, that also that changes the game again, right? So there's things that, again, would have been too slow that have sort of, you know like wherever that line is, it's sort of like moved in one way or the other, depending on how you, how you want to say. It. I don't think that um, I certainly never thought about it as, as sort of like this explicitly as, as explicitly about enabling standard Java idioms, but sort of like as kind of like a, the inevitable effect of it is that you know, the things that people like doing end up being more, call it, more performancely palatable <laughs> over time. Hello, um, thanks for t tonight's uh, conversation. It's been very informative. Um, simple question is, uh, what phone do you carry right now and why? Ah, fine question. Um, so. I'm carrying a Moto X, um, so it's not, well, I guess they just announced one, right? So I think it's the currently released of the not ginormous one, but with, uh, with 64 megs of flash and the reason. So let me tell you what I upgraded from. And let me put it back in my, let me put it back in my pocket first. I upgraded from a Galaxy Nexus. Uh, I don't know. If you all remember that one, that was the Nexus device from like 2011, something like that, from 2011 Christmas season. So, um, so I went, uh, I went straight from a 2011 vintage phone to a kind of like late 2014-ish, whatever, no, mid 2014 vintage phone. Um, and uh, so, uh, so why? Uh, I hate configuring devices. Um, so I used that Galaxy Nexus until it was like on its knees uh, because it's such a pain in the butt to, <laughs> to like when you switch phones. Um, so uh, and then uh, so 
I, and I picked what I picked because uh, my aim was to get something that was kind of about as high end as you could get so that it would be as long as possible before I have to get another one. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Oh, hi, hi. again. Um, so you've not been working on Dalvik for now a couple of years. Can you say what you've been doing since then? Sure. Um, uh, and what would I, what would I pick today? By the way, uh, I'll answer. Well, I'll answer you in just a second. But he shouted out. Like, so what would I pick today? Like, I got this one recently enough that it's like it's kind of it feels to me like the one I would pick today. Um, so I know I know there's like a yet a newer Moto X. Um, it's, if it's as good as this one, maybe that would, would be what I'd pick. Anyway, um, so what have, I, what have I been doing in the, in the meantime? Um, after I left Google, I joined a company which at the time was called the Obvious Corporation but is now called Medium. Uh, Medium is a, uh, a company that's doing kind of another take on publishing on the web. It was founded uh, by a couple of Twitter early people, uh, including uh, Twitter co-founders at Williams and Bid Stone and this other guy, Jason Goldman, who was very early at, at Twitter. Um, I was there for uh, a little over a year. Um, I, I helped get, well, so when I first joined, the Medium wasn't even kind of the active idea, so I was sort of like helped figure out what it was that the company was gonna do, do it all, and then um, eventually I ended up in a role which is kind of familiar to me, but not what I normally do, which is uh, basically DevOps. So I was kind of like the first DevOps guy at, at Medium. I kind of helped get the continuous deployment system uh, kind of up and running and sort of set, set that kind of going. Um, and um, I parted on good terms, um, you know, so the deal was that uh, as the company kind of found its focus, um, with you know, as a call it, as a, as a shareholder, I like really liked the the focus of the company. But as a, an individual contributor, I was sort of like left without a great fit for um, kind of my interests and, and skill set. So like the DevOps stuff is stuff that I, I know how to do and I don't mind doing. But it's not that's not not what I devote my life to. Um, and there are, there are people who are like way better at that than I am. Um, and I was really uh, happy to find somebody to replace me who was, again, like, like that's the stuff that he does. And he was like, you know, um, does, uh, ended up being able to do it way better, again, way better than I could. So uh, I found my replacement and then I made a graceful exit from that company. Um, and then I went to a company called Nextbit. Um, Nextbit is, uh, a, has a little bit of a kind of news cycle going on. They announced that they're making a new phone and they've been kind of teasing about it over the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, I, so I was there for a couple of years and um, a lot of, um, so, and they've, they've been really busy since I left. So I'm, and uh, as I'm no longer an insider, I'm, I'm still, I'm looking, I'm very much looking forward to seeing uh, uh, kind of what they're gonna come out with. Um, but I know that, that, you know, like what I was talking about, like, oh, I hate switching phones and stuff like that. But, well, part of the, um, kind of part of the underlying tension that Nextbit was sort of like founded to help out with was, was that kind of tension. That's why, that's why I went there. Um, so I'm particularly excited. So um, yeah, maybe the next phone I get is gonna be a Nextbit phone. <laughs> um, and um, so the, I did that for, uh, I worked there for a couple of years and for the last uh, several months since uh, February, I've been trying to start a new company. Um, so uh, right now it's, just me and uh, a, a business development kind of guy. Um, we don't have any code yet, but we do have, uh, we do have uh, an idea that we're working on. Um, and everybody else who got up here said it, so I'll, I'll have to say it too. So if you're looking to do some very interesting <laughs> application platform development work, um, and uh, that's the, the kind of thing that, get, that gets you off, maybe you should talk to me. Um, anyway, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, so, so Dalvik uh, was released under it was released under the open source or uh, Apache open source license. Can you speak to like the decision to do that? Was that like a, a combination of personal preference, team preference, Android before and after Google, Google, you know, like where did that come down and how did that interplay with other open source releases internally? 
Um, the, uh, let's see. So, you know, I don't know about Google in general, um, for sure. But I do know that uh, Apache, the Apache 2 license was something that was decided to, to be like the license for, the default license for all of Android. And that was a decision that was made pretty early on. Um, so the, you know, Dalvik getting, getting released on it was not like a Dalvik team decision explicitly. It was more like d the default decision, right? So there's, there were other, so there's some stuff that came out of the Android team that has other licenses. Those are always kind of more like exceptions. So like the kernel code was done under the usual Linux kernel license, which is like, was it like GPL two, but not going forward, right? That, you know, it's like they have their standard, they have their standard license for, so kind of the, the decision for that was, um, you know, sort of like be compatible with the stuff the, that, that already existing open source ecosystem. Um, and I think that was really, you know, that, that's kind of the beginning and the end of it is sort of like Apache 2, unless there's a good reason not to. And there are a couple places where there's a good reason not to. Uh, but for, for Dalvik, there was never a compelling reason to pick anything else. Um, concerning the, the art uh, VM now, do you have any uh, thoughts, um, either likes or dislikes, regarding the design decisions that are in art succeeding? Um, the, I think the general idea of what art is trying to do is, is absolutely the right, the right thing to do. Um, again, um, uh, I'll, I'll go back to, you know, as the sort of the shape of the underlying technology changes, um, the design decisions change, right? So um, with original Android, um, you know, there's certain particular constraints on the amount of flash space, the, you know, the CPU, the amount of RAM. Um, you know, when we had the opportunity to, to start doing JIT compilation, well, so, you know, what, what's, you know, kind of what's interesting about JIT as a compilation tactic, it means that um, you're not wasting, or wasting, you're not using flash space to store compiled executables, you're doing it on the fly. And, and so the downside is it means it takes time while you're running, the upside is that you're not using flash space. And, just to be clear, um, if you look at compiled output, like machine code output compared to bytecode, you know, like that, there's generally an expansion that can be measured in like order of magnitude, kind of. So, um, you know, uh, so like seven x is kind of typical. Um, I don't, I don't actually know what the what the kind of bloat factor is for for art, but it's like, I would be surprised if it wasn't kind of in that zone. So. Um, you know, what, you know, one thing that happened in, again, in that intervening time is like flash space has gotten a lot bigger. And so what that means is that it makes more sense to use some of that flash space as a trade-off for, you know, time taken at, you know, when you're actually, you know, say actively running an app. Um, so, uh, and then, um, of course, what that means is you have, you have to do the compilation sometime. And so um, the natural point for that on Android is uh, effectively, it's like at install time or at, you know, OS upgrade time when you have new libraries to link against. Um, so as a kind of general shape of things, uh, I think, you know, art was kind of the right move. We have time for one last question. Um, I, you guys both asked them multiple questions, whereas you <laughs> didn't, so sorry. Quick, maybe we can do more. Okay. Um, so I know there are lots of questions we can answer on Stack Overflow about this question and lots of blogs out there, but um, being the developer of Dalvik yourself, uh, are there any tips or tricks that you might know of specific that should be kept in mind while developing Android apps for just getting better performance or runtime performance? Um, so I am, again, I'm a few years out of date. So, uh, the, so the thing to remember is that um, Every, it's like with every change of technology, it's like the, the trade-offs are gonna change. And so that's what like when, when Sasa was talking about like, oh, you know, it's like, are you doing something to make it very, you know, easier to do the kind of like the standard idioms? And it's like, yes, but not intentionally, right? So, so um, you know, one of the, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that you, that has happened now is that with, you know, with art, 
Um, you can count on you can count on things being already be, having been compiled um, by the time you're running, and that may change your you know the decision of like if you're of how you're going to write some some piece of code. Um, offhand, I don't I don't have like some like magic magic bullet like you know like recommendation. Um, but actually, here uh, to the extent that I have, I have like a, a universally <laughs> a, a universal recommendation is use a profiler. <laughs> um, <laughs> really, um, uh, you know, uh, I've been I've been in this industry for uh, multiple decades. Um, so, uh, and I, and I'm, this is not going to be an appeal to authority. It's going to be an appeal to stupidity. Um, so I've been, you know. I should I should know where like the hot spots in code are going to be. It's like no, they're never they're never where you expect them to be. It's like you always think oh like my god it's like I have that that's tight inner loop and it's like it's going to be doing it's, it's not going to be that it's going to be like that thing that you didn't think about like you know five files over that's going to be your hot spot and then you're going to like pull out like I don't know like cosine and then it's going to turn out that like that's the thing that makes it running from running like a minute per frame to like a millisecond per frame. So maybe I'll make an exception and give you guys a chance, but if you make him quick, okay? Same for us for the answer. Thanks, Sasha. Two more. Um, yeah, um, um, what's your take on the future of Android? So we've heard about the history. Uh -huh. um, do you think there's a new, uh, how long will Android dominate? You know, Google announced this year, the, forget the name of the project, it's Android will power Internet of Things um, devices. Uh, what do you think? The, like there are other operating systems trying to, you know, eat a Android and iOS market share. How long do you think Android will dominate for Android developers? Like, and then there are now so many devices that, especially that don't support Google Play services in mm -hmm. China, or mm -hmm. we have to support, you know, uh, Amazon's devices. Um, so, what's your take on all of that? Uh, I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm. You know, uh, you know. I think you know. And, I mean, and you know, any technology seems to have you know some kind of natural curve to it. Um, and you know, if uh, even the people who are like paid to like make those predictions, like they they never know, <laughs> right? It's like, are we? It's like, are we still in the ramping up period of the bell curve? Or are we on the like the bottom part? It's, you know, it's like, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, it's like you look at the, you look at like the daily graph that looks like it's like going up into the right, and you're like you can't really tell, right? Um, so um, I have no idea. <laughs> um, I I would guess you know Android's got a a good good few years left in it. Um, so, uh, but but really, I don't know. Um, there's um, I'll tell you. There's a great uh, whatever a great philosophical thing called the Copernican principle. It's both really deep and really useless, but it's I like I like to think of it think of it as uh, uh, more on the deep side. Um, the one of the versions is uh, given it's like if you don't have any other information on something that takes some that that will be happening over some some period of time, there's a 95 percent chance that you are in the middle 95 percent of it. So um, you can you can use this to kind of put make predictions about the longevity of anything. Um, so it's like, so how long, you know, it's like, you know, how long has the United States been a country? It's like, okay, well, it was uh, founded in 1776 and it's still going. So it's like, you know, with a 95% confidence level, you can know that it's going to last between, you know, I, I don't know what the, the numbers are because I don't do that good math in my head, but uh, it's like, you know, it's like maybe it's going to last, you know, like, you know, a hundred more years or maybe it's going to last a thousand years, but you can know that it's like, yeah, it's in the, in the zone. Um, and you'll see, if you look it up, you'll find uh, at least one or two articles about it where they'll, where um, one of them is like some guy, some guy figured out like the popularity of movies based on like the first day of sales and it was like surprisingly accurate. Anyway, so, um, so uh, Android had its first, um, it's kind of like first technology release in 2007. It still seems to be going strong. Yeah, use the, use the Copernican principle and figure it out. I think uh, that answers your question. All right, with that, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thank you for having me.
guys are in awesome hosts. Thank you. All right, thank you guys.